Let's talk a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew. I want to take a moment to break down each of the Gospels a little bit, just a little bit of background information. You've got a lot more material that you're going to find in the textbooks uh, that you can dig into, but I want to, with these videos, give you just a little bit more, uh, just a little bit of background I think might be interesting and important. Uh, when you think about authorship of the book of Matthew, uh, there doesn't seem to be any, any uh, debate as to, as to the fact that Matthew uh, authored the gospel. There is some, as, as, as theologians and, and uh, academics like to do, there is a lot of discussion about when exactly the names were attached to the gospels. Uh, we do know that um, based on um, based on evidence that we have that, that 148 by 140 AD they did have names attached to them and of course uh, Matthew uh, was was one of those uh, Papias who I mentioned earlier uh, in the first video who was a second century uh, church father uh, he is he kind of ex explains and describes the different books of the New Testament uh, in detail and uh, he, his work though is no longer extant uh, though a few of his works did survive into the Middle Ages but were destroyed um, and, and are no longer around. But Eusebius, a 4th century church historian, quotes Papias. And so we, have, we, do have, uh, we do know what he said, we just don't have any, no longer have the books that he wrote. What Papias says is that Matthew was composed as a gospel, or composed the gospel in the Hebrew language and, uh, and that each translated it as best he could. That was the quote from from Papias. Now, I'm um, not quite sure about that. I think even that quote um, lends itself a little to um, to question because the the Greek of Matthew is actually very good. It doesn't seem it doesn't read like a translation, and so many scholars think that it was not at all composed in Aramaic, but actually was composed uh, most likely in Greek, which would make sense because Matthew uh, was a tax collector or customs official and as such would have had a pretty good command of the Greek language and if he wrote the book then certainly um, it, would, it, would, it would seem to reason that uh, he could have written it in some pretty good, uh, pretty good Greek. Perhaps he wrote it in both, who knows. Not that important but it's good to think about these things and know uh, the background. Now uh, only, interestingly, only the Gospel of Matthew refers to him as Matthew, the other two refer to him as Levi. Now, as far as the date goes, when was it written? Uh, Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch in the early 2nd century, uh, quotes from Matthew. So that, that becomes then the, um, the top end of when it could have been written. So it couldn't have been written after that, obviously, if he's quoting it. Um, most of the church, early church fathers were, were unanimous in saying that Matthew was written fairly early on. Uh, some of the sayings of Jesus about um, the temple seem to indicate the temple was still standing. Uh, when the Gospel of Matthew was written, which would then mean it had to have been written prior to A.D. 70. Uh, also, the mention of, the, of paying the temple tax in chapter 17 would also indicate perhaps a, a date that's prior to 70 A.D. because uh, once uh, the Jerusalem was destroyed, the tax was no longer paid. Uh, at least not to the temple, it was paid but after that point to the temple of Jupiter in Rome, but uh, that would have been a major difference. And so uh, it seems uh, likely that the Gospel of Matthew was written prior to uh, 70 AD, most think, but not far, not long before 70 AD. Uh, it is called, uh, Matthew is called the Gospel of the Church. Uh, some of the contents and structures uh, seem to indicate a a, an interest in providing a clear and coherent guidance to the community of believers. Uh, historically, uh, Matthew has been the most used gospel by church by the church in worship, and so it seems to display a a, a concern for uh, for community attention to, for community concerns. Uh, little side comments like you know Matthew 18, for instance, we're all familiar with. You know how do you resolve conflict? Things of that nature. There seems to be uh, just sidebars that that indicate a concern for community matters. Uh, it also suggests that uh, the, the 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 recipients are a community in contact with and seeking to define itself uh, against Pharisaism uh, or against you know Judaism. And so we see those things um, that are kind of lying below the surface as we read through Matthew. Um, not only, were, um, in fact, they're not only aware of the older, better established Jewish tradition, but also found it necessary to explain and understand why it came to worship 
here and not in the synagogue down the street. So there's this, there's this wrestling with identity that you can see uh, in the book of Matthew. Um, it indicates a church that must define itself in terms of a more dominant Jewish movement. Uh, this accounts for the Jewish tone and hostility toward those that, quote-unquote, sit in Moses' seat. So, uh, that seems to be in the, in the background of why Matthew, or some of the reasons why Matthew was writing. Uh, style and structure-wise, the way that the book is structured, there are uh, discourses, narratives, and then transitional statements. And so, for instance, in the beginning, there's a narrative of the beginning, first four chapters, talks about the beginnings of Jesus' ministry, then it leads to a discourse, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And then there's a transition, and then there's another narrative about messianic words and wonders, things that Jesus did. And then there's a discourse on mission and discipleship. And so this pattern goes throughout the book. Uh, there's a narrative telling about growing opposition, and then there's, there's the, the parables that are as a discourse of chapter 13, and so on and so forth. And it goes all the way through the book like that. That's the, the style. Uh, and the, uh, the way in which Matthew writes. There are echoes of the Torah uh, in Matthew, again, with that a very Jewish uh, sort of centeredness to the book. Uh, there are parallels in infancy accounts you know, with Jesus and you know, others. We have Jesus as the teacher of the Torah. We have Jesus as the fulfillment of the Torah. And Jesus as the personification of the Torah are all sort of themes that are brought out or echoes of the Old Testament. And then uh, we see sort of a three-stage presentation of Jesus. He's you know, the, the person of Jesus in the first few chapters. Then we have the proclamation of God's kingdom uh, by Jesus uh, in, the, in, in the middle of the book, the fourth through the 16th chapters. And then uh, we see the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah to his disciples through his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, uh, obviously at the end of the book. So that gives us a little bit of an overview. Make sure you read the text uh, on, on the book of Matthew. I think it will help a lot as we uh, seek to dig in a little deeper uh, on the gospel.